this this arbitrary censorship uh, as it may uh, of social media as well as like the legitimacy of that uh, isn't that one of like is it a fundamental problem of public debate now taking form on private platforms um yes it is and so one of the other things that i was too optimistic about in my book on social media was that um i i said keep an eye on these basically open social platforms so if you look at email and the web they are not controlled by a single company in the way that um, Facebook controls Facebook or Twitter controls Twitter. So you can, you know, now in practice, a lot of us use, you know, Gmail and a lot of us use hosting with, say, Amazon. But um, but in, in theory, you can set up a web server in your bedroom and plug it into the internet and you can set up a mail server and plug it into the internet and it will work and you can send email and you can publish your own blog on your own server and all the rest of it. You know, they're, they're open standards, HTTP and SMTP and all the rest of it. Social media isn't like that at all. It's this it's this world of private platforms run by companies that say, you know, we control this platform, we sell advertising, we decide who's on, who's off, and so on. And that's a lot like the way the internet looked before the web went mainstream. So when I first you know, got on the internet, actually, I first used it at university, but the consumer internet began with, with these closed platforms like CompuServe and America Online. Um, and you bought everything from them and they gave you access and they gave you their own content. And then eventually they became gateways to the web and their own their own content empire shriveled up. And and um, so one of the points I make in the book is we, we with Facebook and with Facebook in particular, it's kind of like a return to AOL and CompuServe. It's this weird information universe that's controlled by a private company. Um, and I my guess was that people wouldn't go on putting up with this, that sooner or later there would be some sort of privacy breach, that some sort of open social platform would emerge and that people would flock to that. And that would be a much better state of affairs because then you wouldn't have you know, a single company or a single boss being able to call the shots. And it would also be you know, more immune to um, government censorship. And yeah, there'd be, there, you know, like there'd be, there would be various advantages to that. Also, if you had a proliferation of open platforms, you'd get more competition between them. The problem is that none of these open social platforms have gone anywhere. So I don't know if you've tried any of them, but things like Mastodon is one of them. Um, what are the others? I mean, there've been loads of them. Um, why, why haven't they gone anywhere? Sorry. Well, there's a, a few reasons. Tim Berners-Lee has tried to start this up again as well. The way these platforms are usually imagined is that, so Mastodon is a sort of open source clone of Twitter, but you have multiple, like with Discord, you have multiple servers. Um, and I mean, it's Discord sort of works like this because you can start your own Discord server. So maybe it's maybe it's an example of that. But um, what the usual way people imagine it is that, and Tim Berners-Lee is trying to get this going as well. The creator of the web, his new project is trying to kind of open social media. Um, the, the idea is that you have a sort of repository of your stuff, which is maybe your blog posts and your photos and you know, the music you've recorded or whatever. And that lives in your server, which is either in your bedroom um, and you could buy an appliance that did this, or more likely you would buy storage space from you know, your ISP or from a bank or from a company that you trusted. Um, and it might even be Facebook or something like that. But basically you would have your own pot of stuff. And then you would decide um, what the... Um, permissions were about which of those pieces of content were shared with other platforms and with other people. So you could say share a picture with a group of friends on a messaging platform, or you could share a series of blog posts with the public on a blog platform. But if at any point you wanted to withdraw that information from that platform, you could pull the plug. And it's all still sitting in your private little server, your, your repository of data. So this is the model that a lot of people have been talking about for uh, kind of the nerdy people who um, you know, who invented the original blogging platforms and who invented the web and so on. They've all sort of said, well, isn't that the way that social media should work? Now, the problem with it, um, and we did have a version of open social media in the early days of the internet, so you'll be too young to remember any of this, but Usenet, the original kind of messaging system on the uh, on the internet, um, was an open um, was an open series of message boards. And the problem with it was that you would typically use it once a day. You'd post a message and it would take about a day for everything to ripple around the world into all the servers and all of the... Um, and it, it turns out that the benefit of centralizing everything to a platform like Facebook or, or Twitter is that a single company can gather all of the posts and instantly give you the feed right up to date. You know, everything... Here's a tweet from five seconds ago. Um, you cannot do that with an open platform, or at least no one has figured out a way of solving it. It's a, it's a very hard computational, you know, computer science problem. Um, and so delivering timely, in-order timelines um, of stuff is much easier if you're a centralized company. And of course, the business model makes more sense too, because then you can sell advertising against it. So I think this is why these platforms, you know, they're, 
they're, they're just a less good experience and they've not gone anywhere. So I would like to see, and I hope that, you know, the current moment where people are reevaluating which platforms they use and some of them are going to messaging groups and, you know, there's suddenly a lot more interest in, in, in new platforms and new ideas. I would like to see um, more kind of open social experimentation coming out of this. But the sad fact is that, you know, about 15 years of experimentation in this haven't really, haven't really worked. The blogosphere kind of was like this too, but anyway, the speed, fingers crossed. The speed of which you like transfer news and get it on your feed, that seems a pretty important thing. Um, and open social media hasn't figured out that problem yet. But I think for, I'm, I'm really not good with technology. Um, so I'm making those decisions about what we wish, would want to like share with others and for, for what commissions will be very hard for me. Well, no, but, you, you make that decision already. When you post something on Facebook, right? You decide whether to post it or not, and you decide where, or you maybe you just put it in a WhatsApp group with five friends. And there are things that you would put in a WhatsApp group with five friends, or send to your mother, or send to your girlfriend, or whatever that you wouldn't put on Facebook. And there's other things that you. So actually, we make these decisions all the time. And on Facebook, you can restrict a post to just some people, or you can restrict an album to just some people. And so you know, the, the, basically, the idea is that you would have those sorts of fine grained um, decisions. And every time you had a piece of content, you could decide which platforms it went to, and who saw it, and under you know. And most of the time, you'd probably just use two or three of these open platforms. But, you know, the idea is that the, the master copy of the data would be something that you owned in your repository of stuff. And if you then decided that one of these platforms was, you know, you didn't like it, the CEO did something you didn't like, or they, they you know, did something that offended you, um, if, you know, trying to take all your photos off Facebook is really hard. Trying to delete or close a Facebook account is really hard. They tell you they've closed it down and you disappear from your friend's friends list. But it's all still there. They've still got it all. And they've, you know, they've actually asked for lots of legal rights to it um, that you've probably granted them without realizing. So, you know, it's it's dealing with that kind of stuff as well, that having your own control over your own data, this is what people say, you know, would be much more elegant. But elegance and people actually wanting to use it in large numbers are not the same thing. Right. Uh, and it it seems like I mean, how, so how optimistic are you then? Because you wrote your book, you know, six, seven years ago, eight years ago, and you thought it was going to develop into one thing and it's developed into another. It seems like a lot of the monopolies of, you know, the, the 150 time, you know, mass media time span that you were talking about have just been replaced by you know, big tech monopolies. And you know, that's the big debate that happens. So do you think that the, could, do you think there's a chance that the technology could kind of catch up with these open social media platforms? Should we think that, you know, with everything that goes on about privacy issues now um, with these companies, do you think this could actually be a viable model going into the future? Well, I hope so, but I don't think it's the only model. I think the main thing that's changed is that we have, yes, we do have these big monopolistic, you know, media platforms like like um, Facebook or Twitter. Um, and But we also have lots and lots of other things. I mean, we have, for example, the podcasting ecosystem. Um, now, it, it's starting to kind of balkanize, but podcasting is actually an open standard like web publishing or like email and so and we have seen a proliferation of podcasts and yes there's a very long tail of them but there has been fantastic innovation that lots and lots of people have been able to launch podcasts um and we're also you know i think when when people say well i'm not going to use twitter anymore because i've been banned or because you know i want to go and talk to my right-wing friends or whatever. I think the fact that there are more of these platforms um, and people are looking at a wider range of platforms, I hope that will mean we get more innovation and more competition between platforms. And people who want to use different platforms for different things will, you know, gamers use Twitch and, and uh, lots of people use Discord for all sorts of things. You know, I think there's, I, you know, I'm optimistic that there's more variation and there's more competition. And ultimately, that's, I think, what we need because part of the reason that Facebook and uh, Facebook and, and Twitter can be dangerous because when you have everyone using the same platform, that gives those platforms an enormous amount of power. But it also means anyone who has a very large following on those platforms has an enormous amount of power. And if we had a more balkanized media system, if we had more different platforms and we didn't have just like one or two platforms that basically have the whole world on them or, or the lo a large proportion of the electorate of a big country on them, then that would actually be better in a lot of ways. We would we would not have those sort of megaphone effects um, that you have when sure. Donald Trump can you know have the whole country, the whole world listen to him just by sending a Trump, uh, just sending a tweet. Yeah, and, and bringing it back to you know the effect of these these uh, these companies and these sites on on kind of our society and our, our politics, isn't? Uh, am I understanding it right that when you have many different platforms, the there's much less of a contagion effect. So networks are more contained, and any kind of radicalization that goes on is is more self-contained. It doesn't spread as much as with 
Twitter or YouTube or something. I think there was exactly, an example exactly. from Reddit. So you get more of a sort of natural sorting of communities into into different um, areas. You know, you used to have like the photographers went on Flickr and you know, so, or, or whatever. But I think um, yes, I mean you're starting to see that now that you are starting to see. Uh, particular communities using particular platforms and each one is much smaller um, you do have the concern that if you're if you if you've got um, what was previously public speech moving into private you know encrypted uh, channels then does that make it more difficult for law enforcement um, it does but I don't think the answer is therefore we need backdoors in, in whatsapp or, or or in iMessage because um, that causes more harm than good in other ways, because the backdoors always end up being used by the bad guys and the authoritarian governments as well. So instead, what we're seeing now, we, you know, people are talking about this, is that um, if the, you know, the the, uh, the white supremacists, supremacists are moving off Twitter and onto other platforms and moving on to, you know, messaging apps like Telegram and Signal, the law enforcement agencies are now doing their best to infiltrate those messaging groups. And that's how you keep an eye on, on people. Um, so yeah, ultimately, I think um, what I would like to see is more competition and more diversity in the kinds of platforms that are available. The latest one that people are talking about just in the last couple of weeks is Clubhouse, which has got a bit of a tech bro, you know, Silicon Valley venture capitalist shooting the breeze um, reputation, which is totally true. And it is totally full of um, Silicon Valley entrepreneurs at the moment, but they are trying to broaden it out. And it's a really interesting model because it's it's kind of like listening to the radio. Um, it's kind of like very smart talk radio with very, very, you know, precise channels. And so it's a bit like podcasting, but you don't have to choose the what you to listen to. You can just say, oh, th these five things are on at the moment. That looks fun. And if you're going for a walk and you just want to listen to some uh, some people talking who are very smart and know about stuff, then uh, then it's great. So I think, you know, what I'd like, what I would like, what I hope the outcome of this current argument about the right amount of power and regulation and structure for social media, I hope that it will lead to a larger number of smaller platforms. And I think that would be better for everybody. But if you have like more diffuse like platforms, right? So there's several ones, then each one is like its own echo chamber, isn't it? Um, well, I don't know, because you get echo chambers within the big um, within the big platforms anyway, depending on, you know, things like Facebook groups and who follows who um, and so on. So, I mean, it does. Yes, it's true. It would allow people to sort into groups of people who have the same views as them, but they do that on the big platforms anyway. So I don't think it necessarily so how, addresses how does, that. How does that work, actually, on, on, the, on Facebook, for example? Everyone well, they go into groups. They go bubbles. into Facebook groups. Um, but so, isn't also the, the algorithm itself involved? Sort of. I mean, I think um, the the algorithm re recommends groups to you that you might be interested in based on your posts. And also um, the, the algorithm, Facebook had the algorithm push groups to people because previously what was happening, it was it was having the algorithm push stuff that they would engage with, which tended to be fake news stories. So it was you know, news stories that were either made up or exaggerated. And they would get a lot of engagement because people would be angry with them either because they believe the story and say, isn't it outrageous that, you know, Hillary Clinton has, whatever she was supposed to have done, sold nuclear weapons to, I don't know what she was supposed to It was all that kind of crap in 2016. And then the people who knew it was rubbish would say, why are you reading this rubbish? And so you get this, what looked to the algorithms, like fantastic engagement and, oh, look at all these people uh, having this wonderful discussion about things. Actually, they weren't. They were all just shouting at each other. Um, and so uh, Facebook decided to downgrade news um, articles, you know, publications, publishers in the algorithm and try and favour posts from members of your friends and family because these were less likely to be inflammatory and they would get it in less trouble with regulators. And so they did this big push about it was all about communities. And as part of that, they pushed groups. And one of the things that did was that um, you end up getting radicalization happening in groups, which are not public in Facebook. I mean, they're semi-public. And that also meant that I think um, Facebook's calculation was that they would have less of a a moderation issue because you know it would sort of be happening behind closed doors but anyway certainly the algorithm the way they adjusted the algorithm was it was pushing stuff at you from your family from your friends from groups instead of from you know the wall street journal or the daily caller or the drudge report or whoever um, and so that was an algorithmic effect to some extent <laughs>